All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Andy McDowell, who is in Atlanta, Georgia. How are you doing, Andy? Doing great. Glad to be with you today. Great. And uh, and Andy actually is a, you spent uh, over what, 20 years at, at Boeing. Uh, and then, and then since then, you've been helping helping people uh, really understand how to bring value through creativity. I was going to make a lame joke about the twenty years that Boeing must have flown by, but you've probably heard that before, so <laughs> I thought I would resist. <laughs> Actually, I haven't, heard, I haven't heard. I haven't heard a lot of that one. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty good. It takes a take, takes an Irish man to come up with a dumb joke like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, and what we're going to talk about today, and I'm really, I'm really fascinated by this, is that creativity is at the heart of generating value in this world. Uh, so, sort of explain to me where you, how you came to this conclusion, and and what that means in practice. Uh, well, value is either uh, generated or extracted in the world. Um, in at the heart of generating value, whether it be in your relationships and your communities through your business, whatever it may be, um, you know, there's different forms of value in the world. There's emotional value, financial value, physical value, et cetera, um, type things. But at the heart of it is creativity is the engine, if you will, behind generating value in the world. And I'm, I'm inherently a believer that everybody is creative in nature. It's whether or not you want to, grab hold of it, uh, see it as a journey, as opposed to, I've, I've, I've got to be a creative person in five minutes um, kind of standpoint. And um, are you willing to go go on that journey? Are you willing to stand there and say, well, that doesn't look that great, you know, if you're doing a painting or anything in a creative mm-hmm. way, uh, but be okay with it because you see it as a journey, as opposed to, I have to be Van Gogh in 10 minutes. Yeah, no, I I agree, and it's and it's kind of funny because it's like salespeople. Like sometimes people say, "Oh well, salespeople are born. You're born salespeople. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can't just become one." And that's not, and we all know that's not true. Same thing is about like people think you have to be born creative or you have to be like very artistic or whatever like this. And um, but to to your point, and I and I agree with you, is that everybody has the capacity for, to be creative within the as a human being you have the capacity to be creative yeah and i think that um one of the biggest problems you know when somebody tells me they're um not creative it sends alarm bells off in my head because we are inherently creative every day as soon as you get out of bed put your feet on the floor you have the opportunity to be creative in your day um when you go to the fridge and decide what it is that you want to cook for dinner you're being creative you're going to create an experience you're going to tr- create a uh, a dining experience for yourself even if you're just cooking a hamburger it's still being creative so uh, there's there's an opportunity every day to be creative if you can understand and see that as you're making decisions in the day you're having the opportunity to be creative in the sense of creating your experience creating your environment creating your friendships um etc during the day and are are you is it is those type things too mundane that you don't consider that being creative in your life or not yeah that's a that's a that's a great point and i think one that you know many people wouldn't have thought about in in those terms but you're right we probably look at those things as being too mundane or yeah, it's not that big a deal. But the reality is, as you say, as you're creating your life experience every mm-hmm. day and in all the decisions you make and the things that you do, I guess the thing is to maybe start the the challenge is to start becoming a little more conscious of that as opposed to it just happening naturally. Yeah, just to, uh, to be living in the moment and understand uh, you're having an opportunity to be creative, uh, even in the type of conversation you're going to have with a work colleague or a supervisor or with a friend or with your spouse or with your kids. You're having an opportunity to create an experience in either consciously or subconsciously. Are you 
understanding that uh, in the moment and are you being in the moment to uh, be a witness to and a participant in that experience? Yeah, and I guess part of it too is your own approach to everything. I mean, is it a is it a me centered approach? Is it a mm -hmm. a more ex expansive or abundant approach? Uh, so if it's just a me centered approach, you're just really going to be going around looking for opportunities to create stuff for yourself, right? Right. Or creating creating experiences for others to share and creating experiences that bring value to other people. That that's mm -hmm. a, that's a conscious choice. Absolutely. And um, in, in the sales world, uh, you're doing that every day. Every time you have an interaction with a customer, whether you're meeting him, him or her for the first time or it's your 10th visit or whatever, you have the environment to create an experience, create a dialogue and hopefully create a partnership um, that's more about them than it is you. And and part of that is that what I find that is is interesting too is that that's what that's what customers or prospects that's what they're really looking for is they're looking for you to create an experience as you said to create mm -hmm. value for them because the reality is correctly or incorrectly the perception today is that pretty much everything is commoditized and you can just swap one in out in swap one out for another but if as a salesperson if you are creative as you said and you build that experience and you're curious and you want you want to you want to do something special then you can stand out and that could that can often be the differentiator between you know who you purchase from yeah and i'm a big believer within sales uh your number one focus in the very beginning should be creating a relationship to go in with a mindset to say i'm not necessarily here for the first visit just to sell you something and walk out with an order, but to understand who you are as a person, your role within the company, what problems, uh, well, quote problems do you have in your business life and in your business that I might have a solution for, I might not. But at the end of the day, when I walk out the door, I want you to have had a pleasant experience and conversation with me. And uh, if I happen to create a great relationship that leads to an order in the next visit or in the next week or whatever it may be. How awesome is that? But at the end of the day, I left at least a great experience and great conversation. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And, and that's, uh, and that's where you see the best sales, the best sales people come, come to the fore, but it's interesting, you know, when you say like uh, create a relationship, some people try to do that in a little kind of, sort of a bit of a rote or hand fisted way. It's like, oh, well, Andy, I see those pictures behind you there, you know, and go through that instead of coming in, mm -hmm. like coming in with real curiosity to learn about the person, learn about their company, learn about this. I think curiosity is the lifeblood of creativity. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, that thread or that string through creativity is you have to be naturally curious about the world uh, and what it has to offer, as well as be curious about the person that's sitting on the other side of the desk uh, from you and understand their journey um, in life, how they got to be in that seat. And um, in particular, do you have any commonalities, whether it be hobbies or um growing up as a kid in the same part of the, of the world or whatever it may be, where is that hook, if you will, that uh, is going to help you make a connection with the person um, more than just the job title or their responsibilities. But um, as a person, can you make a connection that uh, they want to invite you back because of the connection that you've created and the, the general empathy and compassion and, humanness, if you will, that you're bringing to the table. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's interesting. I had another conversation recently with somebody and we were just talking about the whole authenticity piece. Mm -hmm. It's funny how, and I think uh, he mentioned this, but it's funny how at the start of the pandemic or a little bit into the pandemic, suddenly it was like, oh, companies and people need to be more authentic. They need to be, you know, that's what people are craving now is authenticity. And just, and, and his point was a really good one. As I said, okay, what if, what were you doing before this? 
were you being inauthentic or what? So I mean, what's this rush to suddenly be authentic? Authenticity is either you are authentic or you're not. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's something that you can actually fake or create or suddenly go, I'm going to, I'm going to be extra authentic today. Yeah. And people can read right through fakeness mm -hmm. uh, and ingenuine, uh, ingenuousness um, pretty straight away. Um, so not in your, not in your interest to, to come across a fake authenticity because uh, people mm -hmm. read into it yeah so when you when you work with uh, particularly like when you work with people or you work with uh, people who are particularly in sales how do you how do you help because to some degree you may end up you may be working with people who are who've been doing it for a while or whatever got got uh -huh. into some habits how do you how do you help deconstruct and reconstruct the approach? Because, you know, a lot of people are still working off of kind of old models. Well, for me, it's just asking a lot of questions to understand um, their situation. You know, if I was selling a, a part for a machine, I would just ask, how's your operations going? Um, are you happy with it? Uh, what, what kind of service level um, are you having now? And I'm looking for opportunities to show or demonstrate uniqueness for my company and why it might be a better fit or bring better value uh, to the person. But once again, with the curiosity, you got to go and ask open-ended questions that help you um, somewhat be a PI, if you will, um, to try and figure mm -hmm. out how things are going for the person in the company at that point. Um, secondly, you want to make sure that you're a good fit for it. You may not be a good fit. Um, either in your own relationship with the person or uh, with the offering, whether it be a product or service that you're potentially bringing to the table. And if, if you're not a good fit, you don't want to waste a person's time because uh, that's just going to uh, put a dagger, so to speak, into your company's brand and into you yourself. So for me, you'd want to get to the heart of that pretty quick uh, to understand what your opportunity is for the rest of the conversation. No, absolutely. And I think the and I think the the other part of this as well is, as we said about the curiosity piece, but also the validating people like to be validated. Have you ever had a sales call or somebody tried to sell to you? And after the, it's over, you go, I'm not sure they really understood what I was looking for here, maybe. And then you start to panic a bit, like, did, did they really understand? So I think the best people are the ones who, as we said, are, are curious, who ask questions, who get into a dialogue, but then validate their understanding of what's been said. And that is the biggest kind mm -hmm. of compliment you can give to somebody in a conversation is to show them that you listen, but also that you want to validate because you want to make sure you understood. Yeah, in a nice way, you sort of want to repeat back what you heard to a mm -hmm make sure you understood what they were saying, but then it also gives you an opportunity to come back with a little bit of empathy and compassion and say, yeah, I can really understand why that would be frustrating for you. Um, kind mm -hmm. of thing to do that little bit of validation of their feelings about the subject and um, validation also that uh, you heard exactly what it is that they were saying. And if you mm -hmm. don't think you did, then maybe you want to ask another question just to get confirmation. No, ab absolutely. And then I guess the other part of, of being creative is, I mean, if you're going to be creative and you're selling something, then you really need to understand and know your product or service really well. But you also mm -hmm. need to understand maybe how it can be adapted. What What is, and to your point, I mean, sometimes it may not be a good thing to adapt it. It may be a better thing to say, this isn't the right fit for you. But you need to know, you need to know enough about your product or service that you know what the parameters are about how creative you can get. Um, because then otherwise you're just going to continue just to deliver, you know, the, 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 the plain vanilla. Um, if you don't, if, if your product or service is not a really cut and dry plug and play kind of thing where it's pretty obvious whether it's going to work or not, then you've got to have a little bit of creativity with the technical knowledge or whatever it is you have about your product and service to get the person on the other side of the table to understand how your product might be a good fit if it's not quite obvious because it's not a cut and dry kind of situation. And maybe you even have to do a little bit of customization to get it work and you need to be able to express that straight up that mm -hmm. I don't know that this is a, a perfect hundred percent fit, but I think with a little bit of modifications, we can make it work for you. Just be 
transparent, authentic, and, and true about the conversation. Yeah, and there's another thing that I think often is overlooked. It's it's no matter what you well, no matter what your product or service is or your product is, customers are going to use it in ways that you never thought of. Mm -hmm. I mean, we get that all the time on our on the pipeline or CRM side. Is we sometimes are fascinated. We go, "Wow, we never knew it could be used like that." That's a really fascinating use case. So I always think that you know, maybe there's a lot of salespeople who don't do enough of looking across the customer base they have and actually finding out how different people are using your your product or service. Maybe they've adapted it. It'd be such a wealth of knowledge to share with other people because, as I said. Customers are always going to find a way to use your product or service in a way that you didn't anticipate. Yes, and if you're if you're in the job for a while, you might have an opportunity uh, to bring a situation with the use of your product or service that would be a great fit for the customer, or potential customer sitting across the table from you that they may not even thought of. So it's you know it's it's kind of both ways they may be able to mm -hmm. provide feedback they've been using your product or service that you could then go use with somebody else or vice versa somebody else used it in a way that you could then bring to the table um on your product or service they hadn't even thought of and and, and sort of put a, a light bulb over the head and go wow you're right that may that may actually work in our situation yeah, no, that, that's a good point. I actually just had an experience of that. Uh, I just um, leveraged some software for, for a project thing we were doing. And the company who I used have just come back to me and set up a meeting for next week because they want all of my feedback because they're continuously improving the platform. But how many times have has somebody never bothered to do that, never bothered to ask you for your feedback, never bothered to ask you for your input, never asked you, is there anything about this that you think could be improved? And 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 let's face it, if you've started using something, you're going to use it, you want it to work. So if, if mm -hmm. I'm going to give you feedback about how you can improve it, it means I want to use your product. Yeah, it's also a situation we used um, a piece of software uh, that we were heavily reliant on. And we were such a good user of the product. We were often given feedback you know, with bugs or problems mm -hmm. with the software back to the manufacturer of the software that we actually even became somewhat of a beta site for them when they were still producing um, because there was a level of trust because of the knowledge we had and providing the feedback to them that they were able to refine their product and launch a better product from scratch as opposed to <laughs> In the beginning of that process, there was a little bit of frustration on our part because there were just mm -hmm. um, blatant errors. We thought it was a good product overall and had a potential, but uh, you've got to do more testing and quality control before you release it. And we end up um, being able to provide a little bit of that if they gave us a beta copy of what they were about to release. We could put it through its paces and give them some feedback. No, that's that's excellent. Uh, but it does amaze me sometimes how people just don't. It, well, it, there's also an attitude among some people, and you'll find this among some some salespeople. It's like they have the product, they're not saying anything. I'm not hearing any bad news, so no news is good news. So I'm just going to leave it be. They don't actually reach out and ask for any of that kind of feedback because they're afraid mm -hmm. that it might uh, that maybe it's opened the floodgates and the whole the whole engagement will go south well in some regards they were trying to salvage the relationship um, because of our position in the marketplace so they kept releasing mm -hmm. product with a lot of difficulties in it they knew that eventually they'd lose us as a customer so and um, they saw it as a as an opportunity to get closer to us and have us like i said be a beta person and launch with a better product uh, so it became a little bit of a partnership from that perspective. Yeah, and look at that. I mean, and that's such a that's such a great one uh, to finish on today. Is that it turned into a partnership, and that's what that's what you should be looking for in in sales. You know, you don't want to mm -hmm. be a vendor. You want to be a partner. You want to be trusted advisor. Whatever whatever nomenclature you want to use. But it boils down to at the end of the day is. You have to take an interest, you have to engage, and you have to build that relationship, and you need to be creative. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because it's not one size fits all with every single customer. They're, they're all different sizes, different processes, and so forth, and you've got to understand that lay of the land and find the opportunities to be 
the best fit that you can if you're going to have an opportunity to put signature on a contract. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Andy, this has been fantastic. All of Andy's information is going to be below this video, uh, links where you can find it. But before we go, Andy, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. So I'm a, a life leadership and small business coach um, in the Atlanta, Georgia. I have my own podcast with a co-host uh, where we talk about issues in those three three areas. Um, like you said, I'm an ex um, ex Boeing employee it was where most of my career was, but I've always been in um, entrepreneurship, and, and that's really my true love is uh, fighting for the little guy, so to speak, to to to, to find success in what they're doing. Um, both personally as well as in their business. Yeah, well, that's great because let's face it, like, over the last uh, couple of years, the little guy and his small businesses, all of that, they've gotten hammered. And so mm -hmm. it's it's great, great work that you're doing. And I would encourage you, if you're a small business or an entrepreneur, um, reach out, check out Andy. Um, you know, we none of us can do this journey alone. And when you have a when you have a coach or a mentor who can who can help you, I mean. That somebody who's just invested in your success. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that they care about is your success. And goodness knows we all need a bit more of that in our lives. Right. And you don't you don't necessarily have to have your business in the ditch to get a lot of benefit out of a coach. Yes, in fact, the time you should really hire a coach is when you're doing well, not when you're you know, <laughs> not when they <laughs> not when the water's up here. <laughs> right, right. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, Andy. Thank you all for watching and listening. And I will see you all again really soon. Thank you.